Hey, hello, everyone. Hope you're having a good time. I uh, saw, just stepped in and saw a bit of the last. I think we might have some overlap to the, uh, the last panel presentation, but going to talk today a little bit about sort of cracking creativity, as I've called it. I uh, expanded a little from what you may see in your program, cracking the ad code. That was sort of the inspiration that got this started. I'm going to talk about sort of how academics and science has looked at creativity. And then I've got a great panel I'm going to bring up with uh, Ferris from MDC Partners, David over there from AT&T AdWorks Lab, and uh, Pat Stokes, who is a uh, adjunct professor at Barnard. And we're going to kind of talk about more academic side of it, as well as how practitioners are looking at uh, developing creative ideas. So um, to start, you know, first of all, just to set up creativity, I'm sure you guys have had this all week. Sort of think of it in this context as, you know, creativity is sort of creating the new out of the old. I mean, really, to create is to bring form out of nothing. But I think when we're talking here, particularly in a, a business or even artistic context, it's really creating new things out of some existing ideas. And of course, in business, um, <laughs> to be creative, you know, an ad must also be, or an idea must also be appropriate, useful, and actionable. This is uh, Professor uh, Amabile, uh, a Harvard professor who's been studying creativity for uh, nearly 30 years. And this is kind of a theme used in academia for looking at creativity and how it really drives business and she talks about, she has sort of the nice Venn diagram, I think, of how you come to creativity. So it requires some expertise, of course. That's kind of the, the knowledge, the coming new from old, uh, as well as, of course, some creative thinking skills. Mixed in with motivation, and uh, for uh, Teresa, it's particularly intrinsic motivation, as she calls it. So some desire on your own part to be doing something new, to be creative. Um, so now we're going to talk, what I'm sort of going to go through is three main themes, which is sort of what the science has shown on process, which is that uh, both critique and constraint stimulates creativity, we'll get into that, as well as uh, some research showing that individuals perform better than groups in general. Um, but we'll get into these last two points. One of the great things about academia, or frustrating things about academia, is there's always two camps. <laughs> so on the first point, research is pretty clear and overall on individuals perform better than groups, still developing. Same thing on the last one, which is sort of incentives and rewards, particularly looking at financial. This is the idea of motivation, that sometimes incentives and rewards may hamper creativity, which is certainly a challenge in business where finances are, are a big part, financial rewards and, and contracts and working with clients is a big part of being creative. So, you know, started out, has a great quote from, uh, you know, the best way to get a good idea is to get a lot of ideas. And a lot of creativity began with brainstorming as the idea that, you know, Alex Osborne, BBDO, talking about being freeform, get a bunch of people in the room, come up with as many ideas as you can, and not to not be critical about it, just get as much as you can in the room. But in January, leading into his book, uh, Jonah Lair had a, an article come out in the New York Times and both uh, in The New Yorker and that, as well as his book Imagine, sort of was tackling this, or, or as he calls it, the brainstorming myth. So he was looking at research that was getting at a critique of this idea of open form uh, brainstorming. And, and in that, he has one particular uh, study that I'll, that I'll note here that I think is really great by uh, uh, Charlin Nemeth uh, from the University of Berkeley about, uh, less, about eight years ago or so, did a study where he brought groups together. He did some in the pure brainstorming form with no critique, and he had other groups working where they were expected, they were, they were instructed to critique each other's ideas. And then in terms of both number of ideas and in an independent you know, panel judgment of the ideas that came out of these groups, the group that was given the instruction to be critical of each other during their discussion came up with more ideas and uh, viewed as more creative ideas than others. So he brings up other research in that article and it shows um, if there's other areas along that, research along that line of it's not fully free form idea, ideation is not as helpful to come up with really sharp creative ideas. So what started me uh, thinking about this talk was a book 
called Cracking the Ad Code. It's written by uh, Jacob Goldberg and colleagues of his. He's a professor uh, at uh, uh, Hebrew University in Israel. And uh, he also teaches a course at Columbia Business School each summer on creativity and new product development. And his book, Cracking the Ad Code, what he did was he essentially reverse engineered award-winning ads, ads that had won FEs, Clios, that kind of thing. So he reverse engineered them and they found, what they were able to do was realize that it's sort of in, in their, their schema, 89% of these award-winning ads came from a certain set of design structures that they were able to create. So, but not only did they reverse engineer these, they then did studies with groups on the ads that they felt that won these awards and that fit into these structures and they showed them to consumers and did a study where they had the consumers rate both ads along these structures and ads that didn't have these structures and were not viewed as, as creative by professionals. And in fact, consumers also sort of reiterated and came to the same conclusions that the creatives did, that the ads created with these structures were viewed as more creative than ads that were independent of these structures. Um, and in addition, he had, so the, the sort of two structures he came up were, one is kind of like modifications using the medium, the other was modifications using the message. Um, they do tend to overlap a little bit, as you'll see as most things <laughs> that you do creatively have a little mix of medium and message in it. Um, in addition, he also did working groups with people uh, with another study after the fact, giving people these creative templates, and he had groups that had no template and were designing some, a creative idea, a creative ad, and groups that were given these templates and used that to guide them in the creative ads, and that also came up with independent reviewers favoring and viewing as more creative those who were given kind of a structure, a constraint, a template. So just to look at a few quick examples, you know, Univigation is a medium-based one, uh, this ad, so it's, it's using something about the medium. So in this ad, it's a high built billboard. It's for a German basketball team. And the idea was, we're looking for recruits, grab a brochure. And you see that the basketball hoop is uh, pretty high up. So tying right into the theme that they were trying to get at. Activation is something where you create an ad that incorporates some act on behalf. It could be, in some cases, physical. It could also be mental. So here we've got a great one of like, don't drink and drive. Well, there's nothing better than, you know, putting a little road sign where you're peeing, which tends to be, so you're acting on, am I really able to drink and drive? You know, am I, am I safe to drive here? So reinforcing the message. Another one is metaphor. In this case, nice metaphor using the medium of the product itself. So Legos built into a brain, a la, you know, Legos help you think. Um, the other is subtraction, could be subtraction of the medium itself, or, you know, classic absolute example here, you know, subtraction of the product itself. So the product being missing, leading one to, to see creativity, to think differently about the ad than a standard ad. Now we're moving into more of the, uh, the uh, message related elements that he was talking about. So there's extreme consequences that could result from your product or service. So here we've got Parmalat. They have these uh, canned fresh tomatoes. They're so powerful that when you throw them at the comic, they knock the comic out. <laughs> or, you know, an absurd alternative, Volvo focused on safety. Well, you know, what else could you do to make your, your, your driver or your kids safe, right? Wrap them up. Um, there's inversion, which is basically looking at a negative thing that your product or service would solve or help alleviate. So in this case, you can't really see it, it's small, but this is a Virgin Atlantic basically promoting their 59 channels of entertainment. So it's like, you know, you can get away from having to deal with that woman sitting next to you and her boring stories. Um, and the last one they talked about was extreme effort. So, right, the product or service does something that is uh, you know, above and beyond to make your life easier to deliver what you want. So there's, in general, these are two, I think these are some great examples of what is well known in the literature, which is the idea that some constraints, some structure, some templates help you drive creativity. I imagine that was part of the last discussion from looking at the title and some of the themes there. So um, next thing that science, uh, you know, researchers, psychologists, marketing professors have looked at is like, creativity in individuals versus groups. 
It's a little less clear, but studies so far have shown that in general, in dealing with brainstorming or brainstorming-like exercise, ideation-like exercises, in general, individuals come up with more ideas than groups do. A little more free form, the idea is groups you know, tend to work on narrow pathways, there tend to be maybe dominant people within the group who guide the discussion and make it more difficult to have more ideas and also in some cases reviewed creative ideas because they've chosen a more narrow path from the beginning and not thought broad enough. However, and one of the things when we're talking about you know, business and what I imagine a lot of you are, are doing out here when you're coming up with creative ideas for the business you work at or for your clients, you know, these are artificial groups that are done in studies. They bring students together, they bring other people together in a room and they create a group. So studies are not as clear on you know, what happens in our real lives in business, which is groups are created based on specific structures. There are different types of people within the group. So science is a little short on that. I'm sure our practitioners here will, uh, will have something nice to say about that. Um, so there's another great study by uh, Jack Uncalo and Brian Straw Staub which looked at sort of, I think, the, the, the thing to think of is, you know, it's promoting individual thinking within a group. This is a relatively recent study they did, and uh, it's going to be a little hard for you to see here, but uh, basically they, they guided, they primed groups to be thinking of themselves as individuals, and then they primed groups to be thinking of themselves as groups. Um, before they went in and started to work on ideation. So if you were primed to be an individual and you were told to be creative, that's another key here. I don't know if that came up, but studies show that universally, if you tell people to be creative, they will be more creative than if you give them any other instruction. Literally just saying be creative drives creative ideas. Um, so in the be creative, you know, the individual groups are up top there, came up with more ideas than the sort of collectivist group um, it would be practical, it sort of, it flipped a little bit, but not significantly. And then if you look at the, the what was, again, all the ideas that they come up with were rated by a panel of judges um, in terms of number and originality and those kind of things. The study was basically, there's a new rest, a restaurant has closed down as a group, come up with an idea of what business you would replace that restaurant with. So they judge creativity and things based on, is it a restaurant or you know, do they come up with new ideas, non-restaurant ideas, those were viewed as more creative. And when they looked at that, what they found was, you know, a collect, the individual group, when told to be creative, came up with significant more, significantly more creative ideas than the collectivist group, which it sort of didn't even matter. The collectivist group was independent, whether they got creative or be practical they came up with essentially the same number of ideas. So I think in business, it's important to think, remind people to think of being individuals. And the last thing I was talking about was like, do, how do financial rewards lead to, do they lead to, you know, innovative ideas or is, or not? And uh, science isn't perfectly clear on this. Um, there's a Daniel Pink uh, TED Talk, which some of you may have seen. Anyone seen this? Raised 2009? No? Oh, great. <laughs> so this will be a little new. Um, he does it longer and a little more eloquently right now than I'm going to, but there's a study from 1960. There's a, Druckner came up with this idea for creativity. Of, it's called the candle problem. So imagine just the top part here. You're given matches, a box of tacks, and a candle, and you're told there's a wall next to it, and you're told find a way to have the candle raised up on the wall and not drip on the table. And so you get a lot of people and they take the match out and they're lighting the candle and they're trying to stick the candle to the wall and all that kind of stuff. And then the sort of solution is, well, what you need to do is be a creative thinker and pour this tax out of the box and then you can tack the box itself up to the wall, put the candle in the box, light it, it's not dripping. So what he found with this study is when given financial, back in this, this is an older study, but when given financial rewards, the groups that were given or individuals that were given financial rewards took, uh, I think it's twice to three times as long to come up with the solution of taking the tax out of the box. So this is the idea. Nothing else, nothing else different between the two groups and lots of groups and lots of individuals. You give them a reward, stress, uh, some pressure, whatever it is, is still a little guesswork, but they weren't able to come up with as creative ideas. Um, but again, I think, you know, the research has been kind of mixed on that in other studies about whether financial rewards, there's kind of, and I, I know Pat here will be talking about that potentially a little bit because she's been researching it. 
uh, as well. So it's a little more mixed. I think this was an interesting study that came out uh, about 10 years ago by Marcus Bearer and his colleagues which is that it, it, what they haven't studied as deeply is like where are, it's really specific to the individual. So they did a nice thing about, they did a nice study where they had, you know, groups that were, it was a survey of business professionals is how they ran this and they were viewed as sort of adaptive thinkers, which mostly means you are given things to do and then you adapt to whatever you're given to do and you do it as instructed is what an adaptive thinker is in the literature versus an innovative work style, which is where, you know, you take risks, you, you think differently, you don't necessarily follow instructions. And then they had them with, you know, given simple jobs or complex jobs, and then they got rated on their creativity by their supervisors. And, you know, what they found was, yes, financial rewards, if you're, you know, an adaptive thinker, you do what you're told, and you have a simple job, the financial reward's really helpful. But if you're an adaptive thinker with a complex job, you know, it gets in the way of being as creative. Or if you're an innovative person in a simple job, you know, maybe there again, the intrinsic motivation isn't even really there because the job's too simple. So again, financial reward didn't help, it hurt them. But again, in does it really matter? Well, if it was a creative individual, an innovative person with a complex job that challenged them, there was sort of no real result from that. So, you know, in general, I think what we're going to talk about now with our panelists is these three ideas, you know, how, to, how does critique and constraint, you know, affect creativity, you know, re reactions of individuals versus groups in creativity, and, you know, whether financial rewards, uh, you know, wh what opinions are and how financial rewards affect it. And then, of course, you know, the other question is, you know, does creativity, like, does it help to create effective business solutions? Right? You know, creative bads are better, right? Well, <laughs> it's a punt. In fact, this, the academic literature really hasn't studied that yet. So that's kind of an unknown. There's a few small studies. It seems, you know, that have gone a little either way, but they're very small. But including studies that have indicated that in asking about intent to purchase with creative ads or non-creative ads, no. In fact, intent to purchase didn't change whether the ads were creative or not. So that's still an unknown question. How valuable is it for business? So I'm looking forward to tackling that. So um, let's, uh, let's roll our chairs out here and bring our panelists up. So we've got, uh, how should we do this? Oh, why don't you come? You're going to come first. All right. So we've got David Polinchuk here. He is currently the director of uh, AT&T AdWorks Lab working on presently on how AT&T, with all its data, can work with clients and come up with creative ideas and innovative advertising based on that data analysis and customer insights that they're coming up with. David previously was uh, 20 years uh, as a founder of uh, his own firm, the uh, Brand Experience Lab, and he's worked for 20 years on you know, technology development, emerging technologies, he's had award-winning campaigns, worked with clients like NBC.com and Chase and others, um, as well as he's taught at uh, Excuse me, he's taught at NYU, classes at NYU, at FIT. Uh, so please welcome David Polinchuk to the panel. Thank you. <laughs> Next up, we've got uh, Pat Stokes, who is presently uh, the, uh, an adjunct professor at uh, Barnard College, teaching and studying creativity there. She has a long and diverse background. In addition to her, her PhD in psychology, she has an MFA in painting from Pratt, and she also used to work agency side, beginning her career on copy editing for J JWT and other in agencies, and then doing sort of senior creative director roles at uh, Ted Bates Advertising, as well as... Um, uh, uh, Let's see, Jordan Case McGrath, Avon. Yep, there we go. Thank you, Pat. So she has a really diverse background. She's also a, a published author, has a book on you know, constraints and creativity, and a new book coming out on rethinking, uh, uh, rethink, rethinking. What? Re rethinking creativity inside the box. That's great. So she'll have perspectives there. And last, we have Ferris. His last name's up there, but just call him Ferris. <laughs> He's presently the Chief Innovation Officer at MDC Partners, which is, you know, a, a, a big a conglomerate of firms. Does a lot of work there. Previously, he was Chief Technologist Strategist at MDC, uh, at, uh, sorry, McCann Erickson. Prior to that, he was the, uh, I love this title, the Digital Ninja at Naked Communications. Um, did you come up with that one, Ferris? I, I did, but it was a long time ago. <laughs> All right, fair enough. Do you still feel like a digital ninja? Uh, I feel like I won't be able to live it down. So. Okay, <laughs> fair enough. Do you, do you still feel naked, though? 
Yes, always. Every morning. So please welcome Pat and Ferris as well to our panel. Hey. Round of applause. I'm going to slide myself over here. Um, so I just thought, you know, get started, you know, listening to this, David, you know, let's, let's begin with the first one and, and, you know, your experience or your reactions to the idea of sort of constraint or critique, you know, aiding and, and helping creativity. Um, so without a doubt, constraint helps a great deal. Uh, we just built a physical experience uh, uh, for AT&T and we had about 16 weeks to build it and we had an actual budget that we had to, to, to be within. And, uh, you know, there were a lot of things that as we looked at the original design concepts, which were designed in the vacuum of both time and budget constraints, and we look at what we actually came up with, there were a lot of things that fell by the wayside, either because of time or budget, and ended up really making the show, if you will, that much better. So one example is we, we have a long hallway as you come in that becomes our data visualization hallway, and it was originally designed to have mirrors on both sides of the hallway. Okay. That, that, that really looked great in renderings, but when you think about what happens when you put mirrors on both sides of a hallway and then turn one side into a wall of monitors, you get that parallax view. So nothing we would have shown on the, vi on the wall would have been visible. Right. So, so the, the, yeah, the idea was in reality not feasible. That right. was so, the constraint. So the yeah. constraint <laughs> was that by, you know, having to work within some budget parameters, we ended up making it a better experience. So. I've certainly seen that happen a lot, you know, starting, I actually started as a Disney character many, 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 many years ago. And, and certainly saw Which what happened. Which, yeah. <laughs> I, I was the hound from the Fox and the Hound. Really? I, I was, and I also did oh, the electric light parade and uh, the 10th anniversary parade for. Uh, really? Yeah. <laughs> That's super cool. Yeah, it was my first job. And, and there I saw sometimes the, what happens when you didn't have constraint. They, we used to joke that our budget at the, at the time, this was pre-Eisner days, um, at the time, our budget was that we had more than enough money to do it right the second, maybe the third time. And you, you saw a lot of what happened sometimes when we didn't have constraints on it. Great. Pat, I know you're, you know, working on this in numerous ways, probably have input on the science I talked about too. So, you know, what are your, what are your quick reactions to that? Quick? <laughs> but try, tr try to be a little quick. We'll okay. piece it out. You'll okay. get a chance. Yeah. Okay. okay, we'll try to be a little quick. Um, the book I am working on is actually is called Inside the Box. Um, one of the myths of creativity is that you think outside the box. Okay? But the model that I'm working with, which is totally based on constraints, okay, says two things. It says, one, creativity is a problem-solving process. And two, the box, okay? The box is the box of your expertise. It's your tools, what you know and what you can do with what you know, and you can't think outside the box, okay? There are two things you can do. You can make your tools more efficient, and I'm gonna talk about how you use constraints to make your tools more efficient, and you can make your box bigger, okay? You can bring other things mm -hmm. into it. More expertise, More yeah. expertise, okay? I'll stop there. Oh, no, you can go, uh, go on. Go on? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. Just getting warmed up here. We okay. want to hear what, the, what you can do to, to, get, to, get, to get, get more creative. To get more creative. Okay. Um, let me just tell you, a, I, I always tell stories about myself, so let me tell some stories about myself. Um, my box has art in it, so it has Pratt, and it has advertising, it has J. Walter Thompson, both in New York and Tokyo, um, and Ted Bates, and Avon, and, and uh, Shala Rubin. Um, and it has Columbia, okay? And all of those things together, they all worked off each other, but they gave me a very big box, okay? And so what can I do? What do I know because of that box? Well, I know from Pratt how to reduce the world down to three values, dark, middle, and light, okay? If you can do that, you can make anything look three-dimensional on a two-dimensional surface, okay? So you reduce it, okay? I know how to reduce a product's promise down to a single memorable ed, ed line. At Ted Bates, we call that the unique selling proposition. USP. USP, <laughs> okay. You were trained to come up with a single memorable end line. And if you didn't have it, you didn't start, your creative group didn't start writing ads until it existed. And I can talk about some of those later, okay. Um, and since I worked for TV and I was graphic, I also know how to demonstrate a promise, okay, using television. Right. The skills I practice as an experimental psychologist are very related to those earlier ones. So I know how to reduce 
complicated problems into what I call the structure of the solution, okay? And so what I'm gonna talk about as we go on is how to reduce creativity into a problem-solving process and then how to use constraints to reduce the problem. That's great. Thanks, okay. Pat. Cool. <laughs> Ferris, what have you experienced? You know, uh, uh, what are your thoughts on constraint creativity, both personally and uh, this is constrained to the stand. <laughs> I am constrained by it. Um, uh, uh, let's start with constraints, I guess. Constraints are the soul of the brief. Both strategically and creatively, you must have the tighter the brief, the better. Strategically, if the brief does not establish an appropriate solution space, i.e. a problem that can be solved somehow creatively, then you don't have any problems and you don't need any ideas. Yes. So yes. you may as well just not bother. Yeah. You just go home and get a drink or something. Um, uh, creatively speaking, or, 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 throughout history, artists have... I'm not saying that we're artists necessarily, but we're, we're commercial meaning makers, let's say. Historically, oh, well, I think artists require a non-commercial motivation most of the time, but different. We'll see what... Okay. The, the brief issue is different, but regardless. Uh, creatively, all literary and art forms create um, constraints for themselves. Poetry exists as a set of constraints. The reason for this is because the constraints create more creative ideas. They make the ideas less trivial, less obvious. By forcing a, a rhyme scheme or a, or a rhythm scheme onto words, you force people to think of more interesting words that fit the scheme rather than just saying something as you normally would. So I think without constraints, we don't, yeah. People like pushing against stuff. Whether or not they complain about it is, is not the point, really. <laughs> <laughs> right, it stimulates them even when they're frustrated by it, yeah. Well, and I have to say, uh, I'm, uh, at least I can say with Ferris, and I, we're probably like this. I won't put you in this box, but you can. Yes. Um, she, she likes being in the box. She, she said that. <laughs> I just, well, um, well, you know, during the dot-com heyday, in the first dot-com heyday in the 90s, I did a lot of consulting work with uh, startups and all, and, and I would ask them questions about a process or a procedure, and they would always say, we don't have any rules, it's anarchy. And, and the thing about it is, if you're a rule breaker, anarchy sucks. Yeah, that's exactly right. right. There's no yeah. challenge to breaking rules in anarchy. Most of those companies well, died. Right, right. Yes. And a lot of them didn't work because yes. anarchy itself doesn't work. Yes. Um, the, the excitement to being able to bend a rule or to make something, to, to skirt an issue, is that there's an issue. Mm -hmm. Right? If somebody says, do whatever you want, it's not really that exciting. Yep. Yeah. I've tried to brief that way. It goes badly. Yeah. <laughs> With okay. full anarchy, do whatever you want. Well, just, yeah. If you don't set parameters, everyone just runs around in circles. Like, yeah. Well, by the way, the, uh, the other thing of do whatever you like is that this is, I'm going to bring a little psychology in here, operant conditioning. You are rewarded for doing something, okay? The probability of the behavior increases when it's rewarded, okay? So left completely free. Somebody, people always say to me, what about artistic freedom? And I say the only freedom is choosing your own constraints. Because if you're totally free, That's you, quite are, good. Yeah, yeah. you are going to do what's worked best in the past. It's automatic. I might tweet that. <laughs> okay. yeah. Boy, I love it. The panel is pulling out, <laughs> <laughs> pulling out his phone. Yeah. Uh. Okay. I'll remember it. Okay. I certainly, I mean, my, one of the things I work personally in this creative thing uh, beyond the discussion that I know, and I fell right into this and thought it was a great idea. I, do some work uh, and was on the board at a small off off Broadway theater and we do a wonderful thing called spontaneous combustion which is you know and some of you may know it's like in 48 hours there's no plays and then 48 hours later there are 10 5 to 10 minute plays and it's amazing it's sort of you have full freedom you come together and the writers go and I've done it as a writer most of the times and you walk away and you have a night to come up with something by the next morning but we put two little things on it, which has really guided me in the experiences I've had, which is there's an opening line that every single writer has to use, and there's a proper noun of some kind or some other theme, or like, you know, you have to use a Beatles song title or something like that. And it's amazing how much, how I use those things. For example, the first one I did, it was, you know, the whole thing comes down to this was the opening line. And just having that and being able to immediately go, well, let me think of the, this as something physical and like what, would, what physical things work on stage because you have the constraint of being on stage and all that. And I'm like, well, money, you know, what influences people? Well, money, okay, the, this, so that this is a $100 bill. 
and then sort of everything flowed from there. So it, it, it is really, it's that sort of self, little guidance, little self-constraint, constraint of the medium, all those things help, so. Um, David, do you want reactions to sort of the next theme, this, you know, work experience or in general of, of oh, struggles, hampering when working with groups, the benefit of working as an individual, any personal experiences or thoughts on that, David? You know, we talked a little bit about this. I'm a theater person, so I, by background, and I did a lot of children's theater in my early days. And the thing about theater is it's a completely collaborative experience. Um, there is no one-man show where the one man or one person does the show, runs the lights, pulls the curtains, runs the box office, <laughs> does union. the marketing. They're, well, aside from the union <laughs> issues with that. Which you never worked at our theater, did <laughs> yeah, okay. um, you? know, I have always found that working collaboratively within a group gives you that bigger box yeah. because you have different skill sets oh, nice, to pull in. Nice. Gives you those different um, points of view that are sometimes very critical. And without a doubt can be frustrating and annoying when you have a group that isn't necessarily heading down the same path. And that's the biggest difference I see, is that when you have a group that is heading in the same path, so this group that I happen to work with on uh, the AdWorks lab, probably the best team I've worked with. We had 16 weeks to make the whole thing happen. We, we had more than one disagreement. Mm -hmm. We had more than one hurt feeling. Um, <laughs> but all of us on the team were working towards a single goal. So at the end of the day, I could look at things that I totally disagreed with at the time and say, I get it, it works. Other people can do that. When it doesn't work is when you have a group that's not on the same path. And that's when you get people pulling in different directions because they don't really know where they're going. Right, this is the buy-in, a lot of what we study, you know, at the Center on Global Brand Leadership that I run. It, it is, you know, branding, building a brand, building an idea, it requires all individuals to be united in it, otherwise exactly. Well, it's they not, need it's to not be united gonna... in the single theme idea. That's right. They don't yep. need to be necessarily united in the, the components of the idea. A little, little divergent in, idea, in the execution right. or the right. things that, right. that lead to reinforcing that big idea. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what you mentioned was in the theater and in this group also is that the people bring different expertise and make a collaborative box bigger that that's, they're working that's correct. inside. Okay. Right. I think that's true. Um, I'm thinking back to um, what we used to call gangbangs. Um, in the, <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, write that uh, one down. Yes. Where, where's, who's tweeting <laughs> yeah, that? That's definitely okay. that. And, yeah. and by the way, please do not attach my name or AT&T to that quote. Okay. <laughs> that well, cautious. that was, that, this, this was when we were pitching a new product at Ted Bates and all the creative directors and group heads would get in a room and we were supposed to come with the best ideas from our group and it was very competitive. And I learned after a while, you did not bring your best idea to the first meeting. Okay, because uh, right. if it was a really good idea, by the way, this is how you know if it is a really good idea, other people will run off with it, okay? <laughs> it's true, okay. If you have a good idea, people in your group or in the larger group will say, I can do this, I can do that, I'll think about this. It can, the, the, idea is, it, the idea has legs, okay? You never go into the first meeting with the idea with legs, okay? I had an art director partner, Ivan Sherman, who for years would say to me, we do not show this storyboard in the first meeting. I will not bring this storyboard into the first meeting. We will not, and I finally learned he was right, okay. So one of the problems was within my group, within my creative group, we were collaborative, okay. We always started with what, my, with what the strategic line was, okay. So for example, for a, um, a wrinkle cream for, a wrinkle preventive cream for uh, Maybelline, we had the line prevents, protects the skin where wrinkles begin. Um, we wouldn't even go into the big group with that line until two meetings had gone by. Okay. That, that line rhymes. Um, yeah. What? Yeah. It, it rhymes. Of course it does. <laughs> but you said, was it a strategic, a strategic line that yes. rhymes? Yes, it That's was strategic. I can tell you about the you demo for it. You don't need to write ads it. then. You yeah. just got it. Oh, no, no. <laughs> it's, all, it's all based on erosion of the dermis. Okay. We don't actually say that in the ads. Um, but so it was, it was very difficult in those groups because the groups were competitive with each other. Okay, um, but I think I agree with you completely that there has to be a goal in the group and the group are working towards the goal. Otherwise, at, and these groups that they, that they do the research on are completely artificial, okay? Because right. what you contribute yeah, exactly. is based on your expertise, okay? Um, so for example, in, um, before I ever started working on a product, you can never assume that you are the, the, 
the user of your product, okay? And so we always started with the R&D people, the research people, let's go out and do focus groups um, and find out what's going out there before. And so all of those were a kind of larger group that were collaborating. But just put, if you put art directors and writers in a room and say, write an ad for me about a skincare product, nothing. Great. Nothing. Yeah. Maris, your experience? Uh, Thoughts? So, I'm very fond of Joe Lera. I'm very fond of him. I think he's very smart. I like him a lot. His book is very good. You should all read it. I, I recommend it highly. I think the dialectic he establishes between individual and group working is obviously naive. Right. <laughs> it, it, colla yep. it collapses a very long process yeah. into one thing, right? The brainstorm being the concepting, the creative development, the articulation, and the production phase all in one somehow, which it's not. Um, um, uh, group think is a problem, yes, that's true, but creativity being a process, there are some bits where collaboration is quite valuable and some bits where you've got to sit down and just do stuff, right? And working out which bit is which is part of the job when you're putting together an agency together, like I've been trying to recently. Um, <laughs> he, his particular issue is with brainstorms, isn't it, right? Mr. Osborne's invention for BBDO, right? So yes. brainstorms, as, as he describes them, are nonsense. Yes. Let's all get in a room and have some ideas. That's stupid, isn't it? <laughs> That's a stupid way to waste, yeah, waste a lot of people's I'm, time, isn't I'm, it? I'm sure that was the reaction of a lot of people in the industry but, reading that article. But yeah. structured brainstorming is incredibly valuable because you've already worked out the pathways of, of ideation. You've established parameters. You've pre-briefed people with some homework so they're thinking about it. You involve agency partners and clients. Therefore, you get stakeholder buy-in, whatever idea you come up with at the end. So there's all kinds of good social and political reasons as well. Uh, to your point, David. Stake, stakeholder buy yes, is really it's very important. Very important. It's a social act. It's a meeting. There's a reason we have meetings this in person. This was your idea. You yes, exactly right. <laughs> That's why they like to buy them. Exactly. <laughs> also, though, to, to your point, David, I think uh, the world is slightly more complicated now, isn't it? Um, so, if, if all the ideas we want to have involve just words and pictures, then all we need are people who are good at words and pictures. We'll just get them to do it. If you want ideas that, are, that, that exist as code, and a lot of the ideas that we're trying to put together have words, pictures, and code in them, and there's no one in the room who knows anything about code, mm, that's probably going to be a problem, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, sort of to David's so point, yeah, the, 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 the reality, you need, you need all the tools in the room to exactly know if right. the ideas are going to work. Yeah. So the, the, the world where we operate within, the, idea, the kinds of ideas we're looking for are so complex now, or could be, that if we don't have enough people, the, the box won't be big enough, and we'll have just words and pictures. Yeah. Great. Um, down to uh, sort of the last, any, any thoughts on the last idea, you know, as, as business professionals or on the, the research on this, <coughs> this uh, the idea of like, you know, financial rewards, does that help hinder that kind of thing? Any reactions on your yeah, point? I wish I could say I was financially rewarded for a lot of my good ideas, <laughs> but um, uh, you know what, I, I think that I, I wouldn't necessarily say that it's based on financial, but at the end of the day, we all want to be rewarded whatever that means to us, whether that means we're rewarded because somebody sees what we've done and says, wow, what you did was really cool, um, whether we're rewarded because, that, you know, if that's the, the driving motivation because we get money, uh, we're rewarded because we solved a problem that we wanted to solve. I think it really depends upon the individuals within the team. I did a project a couple years ago uh, involving motion capture and playing a video game in theaters for msnbc.com. Right. That was cool. Yeah. Newsbreaker, yeah. right? Uh -huh. Newsbreaker. Newsbreaker was cool. Um, and, and I have to tell you, we'd never, ever done it with a real audience until the first night we did it with a real audience, which, Ooh. by the way, is not recommended. <laughs> um, and so being the smart guy that I am, we, we, we launched at the midnight show of Spider-Man 3, and the audience was there at about, by 11 o'clock, the audience was full and just sitting in their seats waiting. The client was outside doing something, and I said, fire the game up and let's play it, because if it doesn't work, not, not we knew it worked technically, what we didn't know is if, if it, the crowd would work with it. I said, fire the game up, let's play it, let's see what happens, because I'm gonna need 45 minutes to come up with my story if it doesn't work. <laughs> and we fired up the game and I watched the audience play the game, ran out, grabbed the client, dragged her back into the theater where she got to watch the audience request to play the game five times in a row. Wow. <laughs> and I got to hear my client say it was the proudest moment of their life. To me, that was my reward. 
right? That, so yeah, it's not about right. That's that's the intrinsic side of the right. equation. Is there's just value in being coming up with good and executing a good creative idea. Right. Pat, why don't you also, if you have, because I know I want to get to some questions from the audience, I hope, and so why don't you, you know, tackle this question if you want, right. or if you okay. have a couple no, points no. you want to make. No, yeah. no, I'm going to tackle the question because I think you have to be rewarded for something that you've done, okay? So I think where Amabile's work, early work, said that um, extrinsic rewards undermine creativity, come in when you have junior people, okay? So like, beginning lawyers who used to get paid very high salaries, not anymore, okay, for sitting at the printer and making sure the contracts are coming out correctly, okay. That is not particularly rewarding or intrinsically motivating work. They're there, it becomes they concentrate on the money. Even today, if you start in advertising, the beginning salaries are not very high. The ceiling is very high if you're good, okay. And you know what? One of the things I loved about being a group head at Ted Bates is you really could reward people, okay. There were titles, there were offices, there were trips. It was money, okay. Um, when I finally left Ted Bates, it was because Jordan Case McGrath made me an offer I could not refuse. They said, Richardson Vick is going to give us all of their new product development, Pat. What do you want? And I said, oh, an office with a piano in it so I can practice at lunchtime. Because I know uh, only Bill Backer had a piano in his office, and they said, what kind? Okay. So yes, yeah. again, for exactly. <laughs> but you are rewarded for your expertise, for being creative, for coming up with actually I want to put a point in here, creative and practical. The ad has to sell the product, okay? I mean, it really does. I worked in packaged goods, and I can complain about a lot of television commercials now that don't sell anything but the category, okay? So if you are successful and rewarded for it, you will continue doing that. Okay? Great. Ferris, any thoughts on it? Uh, I'll, uh, I'll give it a go since I'm here. I mean, <laughs> it might, seems, might as well. seems rude not to. No, I'm done. Um, uh, uh, those chaps that wrote Freakonomics, they were quite smart, right? They said people respond to incentives. The big, the big misinterpretation of economics was that incentives were all financial in, in the schema of normative economics. Pay people money, they'll do stuff, right? But that's never what economics was really about. It was about what incentives are. And right, there's yeah. social incentives and there's commercial incentives. Where it gets weird is where you try to conflict, overlap them, right? Um, how can, just to explain. Oh, okay, so, and this is also where the areas of like social media-y stuff get a bit confusing too, because there's like money, people driving to try and sell stuff and people doing stuff for free, like in open source economies, because they like each other and want to help. But then brands go, can you do it for us, for money? And they're like, well, I don't want to anymore. You're like, why? Well, I don't know. And I think it's similar to, um, uh, here's an experiment you can do at home. Uh, if you have someone who, uh, who loves you, and if you don't, I'm very sorry, but if you do, um, uh, uh, the next time that they cook you a meal uh, because they care about you and they want you to be fed and happy and they slave over it, and they put effort in, they put garnish on it, like a bit of parsley and stuff. When, when you eat it, right, um, but in, instead of saying, thank you, darling, I love you, write them a check. And then give it to them and say, uh, this behavior I wish to incentivize. <laughs> Uh, uh, because it is good behavior and I wish you to do it more. And, and something will go wrong. <laughs> It'll be weird <laughs> and possibly really deleterious to your relationship. But, but that's the difference, right? You have to know when is when. When is thank you more important than a fiver? When is buying yeah. somebody a drink more important than a raise? Yeah, I think that was the key in sort of what the research, you know, the idea is know what the individuals are doing. To your point, the, the young attorneys, that's kind of that adaptive, simple model. Yeah, yeah. financial resorts are very clearly going to help in that area. And then the other is like, what is the reward? And when is it financial and when is it motivated by other things? So, well, that was great. Uh, are there, I'm not quite sure what the procedure is here with uh, asking for questions from the audience. Is there someone walking around with a mic or is it just yelling, just raise your hand and shout? We've got one right here. Great. You know, as, a, as an executive um, with pay scales, you reward people to get them and to keep them. So you're always conscious of what they want. 
Okay, I mean, if you work with a group of people, you know who cares about having a bigger office and better furniture. And so, for example, junior copywriters think it's a big deal to go on a shoot. Okay, but by the time you become a creative director, what you don't want to do is go on a shoot. Okay, um, so I, I think, I don't think you need to study for that. I think what you need to do is study the people who work for you. Yeah. Yeah, that, that seems to be it, is, is that is very much an individual learning your yeah. team to the point of the, you know, the discussion of collaboration and yeah. Yeah, finding the things that will create that intrinsic motivation and sometimes it can be a financial reward will help with the intrinsic. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions in the audience? I have a question, I'm sorry, I'm up here. Yeah, go. Yeah, we, that, that's a big thing in academia, this sort of translation of things among people with yeah. different skill sets. Yeah, go ahead, Ferris. I'll have a very quick go, because I do try and do this quite a lot. Uh, it doesn't always work. W one of the problems uh, between digitally type people and non-digitally type people is, is that you can be divided by a common language, to quote Oscar Wilde. Let's take the word platform, for example, which gets used a lot in our industry, doesn't it? To a digitally type person, a platform is a software and hardware stack you can write software into. So it, you have to be able to build on it, use its API functionality to create new products and services. It, to an ad-like thing, it's a line or a creative architecture that holds concepts together, for example. So you could be in a meeting and everyone could agree on something and you could have completely different ideas about what you've agreed on. <laughs> That's a challenge, isn't it? Yeah, it happens a lot. Um, uh, I think there's a couple of ways, right? Um, if you start with one bit and then brief the next bit, inevitably the one bit determines what the thing's going to be. So if an ad bit decides to brief the digital bit, it'll be an ad with digital bits, right? So uh, casting is really important and also reconstituting the creative team in different ways that you keep trying different variants. A strategist and a copywriter, an art director and a technologist. Well, see if that works and iterate it a little bit. Um, and the other thing I think is... Uh, getting everybody up to speed on what words really mean. <laughs> so establishing common grammar and vocabulary is probably quite useful for all of us. Uh, yeah. Any other comments on the panel on that? No? Okay. Yeah, as as oh. the old guy usually in the room, yeah. I just remind the young people that they're always wrong. <laughs> well, it's a technique I, I've gone with for a number of years now. And, uh, yeah. I absolutely agree. That's what, right, yes. Authoritarianism before. can be an effective method to get everyone on the same page. That's right. right. There's a decision yes. study that shows that works. <laughs> I think we've got time actually, for... It, oh, it, go no, it, no, it does work. There has to be somebody who says, this is the strategy. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. With that, you know what? And, and seriously, yeah. that is one of the things that works is that you don't have to necessarily have people buy into, again, the tactics, but they have to buy into the direction. So whoever is setting that meeting, running that meeting, needs to make sure that everybody in the room at the end, because they, they, they won't start there necessarily, but that at the end, you're all going down the yellow brick road together. Mm. Whatever that yellow brick I, road is. I think is. that's super important. And I do think that, uh, being less flippant than I usually am, but um, the challenge then for the strategist or the planner or whoever does that bit of it, it doesn't matter who does it actually, I don't care, is that the thing has to be generous enough and extensible enough to inform application development, product development, business behavior, brand behavior, logo types, advertising and design. Uh, and, and ad propositions often are able to do that. Okay, well, yeah. we're talking about two different things then. Possibly. You're talking about starting with designing the product. I always had the product, yeah. Yeah. and I was advertising. Right. That's yeah. a huge yeah. challenge. Totally. So it's, yeah. huge, yeah. it's a huge difference, yeah. 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 But, but even, I think, one, even once you have the product, if you know what the product is, right? you, yes. you get handed this bottle of water, and you're told that you need to create something. <laughs> yes. Um, I, I think, Ferris, to your point is that where people get frustrated is when 
you automatically sh shut down channels today. Mm -hmm. So, uh, hey, by the way, this meeting, we're not talking about social. This is really just to talk about the print campaign, or this yeah. is just to talk about the TV campaign, or this is just to talk about the social campaign. If you're not starting with, again, that big picture to be able to say, here's how social fits into this idea, mm -hmm. here's how the advertising, you know, the traditional advertising fits in, here's how this fits in, then that's when people start to feel slighted, and that's when the competitiveness comes in. Yeah. Great. Linda, what time for one last question, do you think? Need the crew. Yeah, OK. I see a hand right there. Go for it. Thanks. I think that's a big part of the creative conundrum of the talking about there. If you have set a goal, then people can work towards it, and they can be praised about it, work within these constraints. However, if you tell people what the goal is and put the cart before the horse, so to speak, then the only answer, the only great answer you're going to get is the one you've asked for in the first place. So I just swear that. Yeah, it's an interesting. Paradox, I know, that comes up, yeah. I don't quite understand the question because what I'm, what I'm saying you start with is, so a strategy, okay, so if I start with protects the skin where wrinkles begin and it's based on research, so I'm gonna use this example because it's graphic, that basically what the sun does is it breaks down the dermis, okay, and then it's sort of like this little, you know, erosion of the top line, that's how you get lines, okay. Um, and so that's the, that's the research part of it, and you give that to your people. Everything has to have a graphic that goes with that and has to go to that end line, okay? That's the, that is the goal constraint, okay? They can get there any way they like. It doesn't determine, and in fact, what I've discovered and what, lots of, what people in, in, in the business know is that um, the more restricted, the more well-defined that, that strategy is, that end line in advertising, the more interesting executions art directors and writers can come up with. However, they'll never come up with an experiential for that idea. What is well, an experiential? Okay, so, so there are times okay. uh, I was building a physical space, yeah. right? Okay. At the end of the day, I didn't really care about anything else. I had 3,000 square feet that needed to be okay. rebuilt. Okay. So in that case, I had an end goal. If I'm staging a theater production, I'm, I, eventually I'm going to be on stage, mm -hmm. right? But it's within the, the realm of that that you create the pathways for the other thing. I, we're getting the signal to cut, but yeah. <laughs> we, we can talk more about this, but there are ways to do it. It's the huge, it's the single biggest challenge we face. Who decides which kinds of ideas? If it's not us, then someone's going to tell us, here's your ad money, go make some ads, thanks very much. Okay, then the, question, the real question is, what is the purpose of spending the ad money? Okay, is it to entertain people? I think not.